110 years ago, New Mexico officially became a state. But the history that makes our state so unique started long ago. Some of it surrounded in controversy. And some accomplishments reach around the globe. These experiences make us who we are. And drive the deep pride we have as New Mexicans. Tonight, we celebrate our history and heritage. Good evening and thank you for joining us for Celebrate New Mexico. We are here in the Santa Fe Plaza. The capital city has been ruled by Spanish, Mexican, Confederate and U.S. governments. At more than 400 years old, it is the oldest capital in the U.S. And tonight we are looking at the people and places that make our state what it is today. Starting with the first people to settle here 23,000 years ago at White Sands. Back then, this area was a lake surrounded by wet and grasslands. Today, you could see human footprints preserved, making it the world's largest collection of fossilized tracks. And in eastern New Mexico near Clovis, the site of Blackwater Draw is where 13,000 years ago, people lived off the land hunting bison. Evidence of the first settlements can be seen in cliff dwellings at Chaco Canyon, and those evolved into pit houses like these. By 850, the Anasazi developed monumental buildings with distinct architecture. They studied astronomy and made art. Chaco Canyon became a hub of ceremony, trade and government in what's now the Four Corners. By 1150, people began to leave Chaco Canyon, settling throughout the state. Once there, cultures, languages and artwork continued to thrive. Brown Albizu explains how they developed into what we now know as Pueblos. Pueblos are very unique to New Mexico, and New Mexico is obviously very much influenced by Pueblo culture and traditions. Pueblo, a Spanish term meaning village or town, renowned not only for its tribal governments, but early influences of non-native culture. There's really a rich history of trade across the Americas, and Pueblos are, are very much positioned to to receive a lot of these influences. Experts believe there were approximately 100 Pueblos in New Mexico, but with European colonization in the 1500s and the brutal impacts of warfare and disease, groups were quickly eradicated. Today, 19 Pueblos remain. 45 minutes from Santa Fe sits the O.K. Owinge Pueblo, tracing their history back at least 10,000 years. Right in here is where we said we, we emerged. To this day, adaptation is considered a core value. It was recorded that we had our irrigation system. So that's another important part. And it was recorded that we had our own government. Continuing practices and customs. The ancestors left a lot of prayers. A lot of prayers that, that dealt with the time then and a lot of prayers that are are still today that are still a part of today's world. The strength of a Native American Pueblo often correlates to its size. In New Mexico, territories can range anywhere from the Okeo Wingay Pueblo to the Navajo Nation, the largest land area retained by Native people in the United States. 27,000 square miles of unparalleled beauty in parts of Utah, Arizona, and New Mexico. The Navajo Nation differs from most Native American tribes with a population of over 400,000 people. But it wasn't always that way. Six very hard and horrible years for the Navajo people. Four years of forced internment and two years of forced removal to Bosque Redondo, New Mexico. The Treaty of 1868 allowed the Navajo to return to their homeland, but allowed U.S. leaders to live within their lands and build railroads. In return, the U.S. promised education and new infrastructure. Unfortunately, the Navajos have stuck to their end of the bargain, but the United States government has yet to do that. 150 years later, a new hope for the reservation, and just like the Pueblos, pride in their ability to survive. I think people come to the Navajo Nation to see the beauty and to experience the Navajo people. We do our, our very best to share our culture, our tradition to our visitors. It's important to understand the history of indigenous people in New Mexico. There's nowhere in the world where Tewa is spoken besides New Mexico. There's nowhere in the world where Zuni is spoken besides Zuni Pueblo. And so it's very unique that these place names are attached to language and attached to those cultural traditions. But what's truly important. Through all our history, pain, torture, our struggles, our successes, our strife, we are still here. And I think it's very important for every Native American to understand why that's so important. 
Each of the 19 pueblos in New Mexico represents a sovereign nation with its own government. Five native languages are also spoken among the people of the pueblos. Explorers from Spain landed in Mexico in the early 1500s. After defeating the Aztecs, they created a Spanish province called New Spain. They wanted to expand their territory and sent a small exploration north, discovering the Zuni Pueblo in 1539. Stories about cities of gold made their way back to Spanish leaders in Mexico City. So, in 1540, Francisco Vasquez de Coronado was sent to conquer the north, but didn't find gold and was forced out. As all of this was happening, Spain was under pressure from the church to Christianize native people. So the Spanish government appointed Juan de Oñate to lead a caravan of priests and settlers into what is now New Mexico. This began a turbulent and violent relationship between Pueblo Indians and the Spanish that still haunts many New Mexicans today. Juan de Onate is a controversial figure in New Mexico history. He's seen as a hero by some for leading the Spanish colonization of New Mexico in 1598, but he's also viewed by Native Americans as a killer who repressed and enslaved their ancestors. Their first encounters with Pueblo people was just like, okay, we're here now and this is all ours now, but you can stay here and but you're ours now. The Pueblo people were here first. We we just found out that they their ancestors were here 23,000 years ago. So they've been around. They knew the land and there's limited resources here, especially water. So when the Spanish come up here, they put pressure, demographic pressure on the Pueblos. And so it creates tension just from that point of view. The Pueblo people didn't understand why the Spanish believed they were entitled to the land. Imagine somebody coming into your home and saying, this is all mine now. You can still live here, but you have to pay all of this to me and you have to believe my beliefs and you have to give me all of your resources that you saved for the winter. But in 1680, Pueblo Indians pushed back. They used arm resistance and it worked. The Spanish were pushed out. What we get from testimony is that they wanted to decolonize, essentially. They wanted to get rid of everything Spanish. Pope ordered those people who had been married by a Catholic priest to not be married anymore, to go to the river and wash the baptism off of them, the Catholic baptism. Freedom from the Spanish lasted for years. In 1692, the Spanish attempted recolonization, or La Entrada, Conquistador Don Diego de Vargas led that movement, in which eventually Native people agreed to cease hostilities and yield to European rulers. There was fights and turmoil because the Spanish did still come back in with that heavy hand. For years, the city of Santa Fe marked this movement with a reenactment, celebrating this time in the state's history. So you have this creation of a pageant that's very kind of uh, sterile, it's entertaining, it's fun. But it's not uh, the full historical picture. After outcry from Native people, Santa Fe leaders eventually removed the pageant from fiestas. Pueblo people and the Spanish lived together along the Rio Grande for about 100 years. And then in 1821, the people of Mexico rose up against Spain, taking control of Mexico and the Spanish colonies. The newly formed Mexican government was in constant turmoil and paid little attention to its northern territory, leading the way for new opportunities. And that Santa Fe Trail really established this vital economic link. And this became important politically because it really tied sort of the elites of New Mexico more to Missouri and more to the United States than down to Chihuahua and further south into Mexico. And they started seeing their future with the United States. It also drew Americans out west. Brother fur trappers William and Charles Bent built an adobe fort along the trail. Not only did it serve as a peaceful place for trade, but also a staging ground for the U.S. Army in 1846. That year, General Stephen Watts Kearney marched on Santa Fe, taking the capital peacefully after the Mexican Army fled south. He appointed Charles Bent as the first civil governor of New Mexico, but his term was cut short when he was beheaded during an uprising in Taos. The Mexican-American War ended on February 2nd, 1848, with the signing of the Treaty of Guadalupe Hidalgo. The Americans took over the Mexican territory and claimed all of what is now New Mexico, as well as other territory to the north and west of us. People say, you know, we didn't cross the border, the border crossed us. Two years later, the U.S. officially recognized the area as a territory, 
Over the next 13 years, it was divided to create the Colorado and Arizona territories. New Mexico was also involved in the Civil War. In 1862, the Confederate Army arrived, defeating the Union Army at Valverde and eventually taking over Santa Fe. Union troops from Colorado were able to stop them in the Battle of Glorieta Pass. As the Confederate Army was pushed back to Texas, they buried eight cannons behind San Felipe de Neri Church right here in Old Town, so they could not be used against them. The end of the Civil War brought more attention to the New Mexico Territory. Texans brought cattle into the area, developing contracts with the U.S. military. This led to an economic boom and violent competition. Irish Americans Lawrence Murphy and James Dolan ran a general store that controlled cattle contracts in Lincoln County. Rancher John Tunstall, an English immigrant, believed beef contracts should not be monopolized. This power struggle caused the corrupt sheriff run by the Murphy Dolan faction to send a posse killing Tunstall. His ranch hands witnessed the murder, one of which was Billy the Kid, who swore vengeance for Tunstall, beginning his path as an outlaw. Despite having the population numbers needed to become a state, New Mexico spent 66 years as a U.S. territory. John Carnielli explains why the path to statehood was not an easy one. Representation in Congress, better infrastructure, and respect. All reasons people here were pushing for statehood. But there were a lot of misconceptions of what New Mexico was and what this territory was. The U.S. had never acquired an area with such a large population so quickly. The New Mexico Territory once belonged to Mexico and was long in control by Spain. New Mexicans were perceived as foreigners. And so for a very long time, there were people like, well, why should they become a state? This, they're, they're not Americans, they're foreign people. People were primarily Catholic, spoke only Spanish, and were viewed as poor. There was also a sense of lawlessness. And so there was a real fear of having these people who were perceived as foreign from letting them be officially part of you know, the American experience, if you will. Over time, perceptions changed thanks to the arrival of the railroad in the 1880s. The Atchison, Topeka and the Santa Fe Railroad promoted um, New Mexico both as exotic but also tame. So it was an exciting place for people to come visit on the train and, and to learn more about this place. People living in the area, like Antonio Joseph, were making a push for New Mexico to become its own state. He really became an advocate for um, New Mexico in Washington, and this is a pamphlet that he created to Washington to appeal for statehood as early as 1888. Then in 1898, the Spanish-American War began. President William McKinley contacted Governor Miguel Otero to recruit soldiers for the war. New Mexicans responded enthusiastically, becoming the largest contingent of Theodore Roosevelt's Rough Riders. Their bravery showed New Mexico's loyalty was with the Union. In 1909, President William Howard Taft made a brief rail stop in Albuquerque, where several local politicians made their case for statehood. Taft assured them he supported the cause and a state constitution was drafted. It would go from here in 1910 to the Congress and finally be ratified as a state in 1912 in Washington, D.C. by the national leadership. Making New Mexico the 47th state on January 6, 1912, New Mexicans couldn't wait to add their star to the American flag. Well, this is the 47 star flag, unofficial New Mexico flag of the in the United States. When people were so excited that they added just one star to the official 46 star flag. So this is a really unique artifact. In 1912, the state seal was also designed with the Latin phrase, Crescit Eundo meaning it grows as it goes, a fitting motto for the state to this day. I think in some ways it reflects the people who are here um, that continue to adapt and evolve and at the same time maintain our sense of, of unique identity that is not generically American but uniquely New Mexican. The original capital was the Bataan Memorial Building before the Roundhouse was built in 1966. We are celebrating our state's contributions. The scales of history, the balancing out. Our impact on the world stage. And how World War II led to a new car culture that many today are working to preserve.
Welcome back to Celebrate New Mexico, our history, our heritage. People here have a long and proud history of standing up to defend freedom for the U.S., dating back to the Civil War, when more than 8,000 soldiers volunteered for the Union Army more than any other Western territory. And in 1898, providing the most volunteers for Teddy Roosevelt's Rough Riders during the Spanish-American War. And that patriotic participation continued through each war, battle, and conflict not only from New Mexicans, but indigenous people here as well. 1914, New Mexico was only two years old, but already going to war for its new country. New Mexico was the fifth in the nation for per capita enrollment as soldier and sailor. We were very proud of our contribution. After that conflict, federal money started flowing into New Mexico with the building of Kirtland Air Force Base and secretly Los Alamos National Lab. And our state's patriotism continued when almost three times as many men, women, and indigenous people served in World War II. That is also when code talkers would baffle the Japanese. 29 young Navajo men developed a code with their native language and our enemies could never figure it out. The Navajo in World War II who many people point out had every reason not to support the government, extraordinary support through uh, particularly the code talkers. They are credited with major victories, including Utah Beach on D-Day and Iwo Jima. In the 1980s, Dr. Holtby worked on a book. In fact, he was one of the co-editors of a Navajo book that included words, definitions, and phrases. Again, this was four decades after the end of World War II. And one of the first orders they got for that book was from the Japanese government. The Navajo experience shows how a group set aside whatever animosity they had toward the government for violating their treaties uh, and took up arms and performed heroically. They were not fully recognized for their service until 2001 when then President Bush presented them with congressional medals. Another tragic contribution, the Bataan Death March of 1942. That's when 1,800 of our New Mexico military were forced to march 65 miles through jungle terrain in the Philippines. Half of them died. Almost at the same time, happening secretly at Los Alamos, the Manhattan Project. The controversial development and testing of atomic weapons led by J. Robert Oppenheimer and a team of scientists who could tell no one what they were working on. And that nuclear explosion test here in southern New Mexico ended the war over there in Japan. It's what I call the scales of history, the balancing out. Yes, you can f argue a uh, positive impact. It helped end the war. Then through the Korean conflict, Vietnam, Desert Storm, and the war in Afghanistan, more proud participation, but also pain and suffering, emotions they could only share with each other. The veterans themselves for decades had known the only people they could talk to were other veterans. Despite the draft ending almost 50 years ago, service from New Mexicans remains very high across all military branches. With the end of World War II, industry began to boom across the country. Yeah, more families were buying cars and hitting the open road. Constructed in 1926, Route 66 was the nation's first all-weather highway from Chicago to L.A. About 535 miles of this historic blacktop meander through our state from Tucumcari through downtown Albuquerque and Gallup before heading into Arizona. Trading posts, motels, and restaurants lined the route. As the road gained popularity, so did traffic, forcing the need for a network of highways across the U.S. Route 66 was not only a road for cars to travel on, but an avenue for ideas on how to build them. Yeah, combine that with soldiers coming home with mechanical skills, you get a new art form. Eric Green traveled to Española, the lowrider capital of the world, to learn their history and what's being done to preserve their legacy for future generations. For decades now, lowriders have cruised the roads around Española. We don't know if it originated in L.A., El Paso, northern New Mexico. After World War II, the auto industry boomed, and many returning from war had new mechanic skills, along with an introduction to airplane hydraulics. And there was a huge amount of traffic back and forth between New Mexico and East L.A., and somewhere in there, cars began to be passed back and forth. The basic blueprint of a lowrider has always been the same. The Hispanic community was sort of saying, you guys want to jack up your cars and go fast, but well, we want to drop ours and go low and slow. It was a way of expressing themselves. And it's still alive today. 
I just grew up loving lowriders. It's just the way we were brought up, like our grandfathers, our fathers. We're just used to having them. It's just like part of our culture. Yeah, ever since I could remember, my dad's had cars that were lowered to the ground and scraping around town. Louis Martinez is working on a new Cadillac so he can do the exact same thing. Ah, the reliability about it. And second, for my son to put a car seat in the back. <laughs> His son may be just old enough to walk. That's Santa's caddy. But he definitely knows how to lift and drop a lowrider. These cars simply command attention. Cars are important to people here, aren't they? Oh, yeah. It goes generation to generation. Once we get them, you just save them for your kids or your grandkids. No one really knows just how many lowriders are tucked away in garages around here. Kurt Loder said uh, Espanola was the lowrider capital of the world on MTV. It's in my blood. I grew up around it, and I just try to keep the tradition going. And preserve it for the future. This is an old high school cafeteria. It's a building Rio Riva County told the Lowrider Museum Board they could use to turn into their Lowrider Museum. They even held a groundbreaking event, but then COVID hit, and now they're hoping to get restarted on the project. So everyone can celebrate these beautiful machines. Most Lowriders sell for forty to $75,000, but some of the real fancy ones are worth over 100000 it's a blend of food styles and ingredients from all over the world. Where our foods come from and how they combine to create those unique flavors we all enjoy. And celebrating our pride, what it means to be New Mexican. talk about food. When the Spanish arrived in 1519, they brought livestock and foods the people of the New World had never seen. Things like sheep, horse, cattle, pigs, and chickens, as well as melons, apples, sugar, and wheat. Indigenous people introduced them to corn, squash, peppers, tomatoes, potatoes, and beans. Now to put this into perspective, before this time, there was no tomato sauce in Italy or potatoes in Ireland. Here in New Mexico, these ingredients all come together to create a unique fusion of culture. Angel Salcido spent some time in the kitchen with a local chef to learn more about New Mexican food. New Mexico food is the best food in the world. Behind every New Mexican dish is a New Mexican story. But what makes a dish New Mexican? It's a blend of uh, food styles and uh, ingredients from all over the world. Ariston Yazi is a native chef. He says it's a story of culture fusion. And our state's 19 pueblos have deep roots in New Mexican culture. We are just pretty much learning more and more every day about different cuisines, different cultures. To learn more, Ariston brought me into the kitchen. Put it in there, grab it. To help. Oh, geez, go back. Yeah, I didn't do it right. As much as I could. First, a fan favorite, the Tewa and Navajo taco. So how much do I put on it? Its roots date all the way back to the Civil War. They give us flour, oil, and uh, salt. And that's all we have for ration while we're trying to survive. Uh, Navajo taco is very uh, New Mexican, and it's very Navajo, but it has these elements that you'll find in a Novo Mexicano kitchen. This is on ground beef, just one scoop in. I'll do this one. This is a Navajo taco. We use lamb on this one. They've turned a war ration into an incredible cuisine. Voila, done. Mm -hmm. That's it. Awesome. Spanish culture is also influencing the foods we know. Blue corn enchiladas are the perfect example. You get a few months taste from the cheese, the corn, the saute of the squash, the corn also here. This, this is um, seasoned corn with uh, jalapenos, cilantro on top of it. Each culture and skill set comes together to create everything. This is the bison. Wow. Look at that. We are a mixed people, mixed blood, mixed culture. It's the culture that Ariston hopes to celebrate through food for years to come. We all hope that uh, the people that not only in the state, but throughout the nationally and internationally, know that we're still um, driving and we're able to bring people, our cultures, and our ways to the outside world. Americans also introduced baking powder, giving rise to sopapillas. It's uniquely spicy and filled with flavor, often adding a little more zing to anything from hamburgers to pizza. But did you know green chili didn't originate in New Mexico? Early Spanish explorers discovered the fruit in South America before bringing it here in the early 1600s. For hundreds of years, chilies were inconsistent in flavor, 
prone to disease and needed a lot of water to grow. So in the late 1800s, Dr. Fabian Garcia worked to create a new chili that would be bigger, tastier, and resist wilting. After nine years of research, he developed New Mexico number no. nine, the first chili pod with a dependable size and heat level. It really uh, led the way to commercial production where farmers would start growing this, uh, selling it amongst their community. And then the canning industry kicked off full force about uh, the time World War II ended. Today, all chilies grown in our state can be traced back to that pepper. It takes about 80 days for chili to grow, and each plant produces 10 to 20 pods. The Zia sun symbol is the sacred symbol of the Zia Pueblo. Its meaning is significant, representing the four parts of the day, four seasons, four directions, and four stages of life. All of the rays are bound by a circle, no beginning and no end. The Zia people believe there are also four sacred obligations, develop a strong body, a clear mind, a pure spirit, and a devotion to the welfare of people. The state added it to our flag in 1925 as a symbol of perfect friendship among united cultures, but never asked the Zia Pueblo for permission to use it. In 2012, the house apologized to the Pueblo. It has grown to represent so many things for so many people over the years. We spoke with New Mexicans about why they have so much pride. Sunshine, <laughs> good weather, nice people. It's a very kind place. We're proud of our food, four seasons, and our landscape is beautiful. Rich history that goes with that. The mix of cultures and the historic nature of the town. And it's kind of fun to see how it melts together. It's not that you're just in any Western town, it's that you're here in New Mexico and you can feel that. A lot of pueblos that are just magical. I love how much of a, a hidden secret that it is. It's a little bit off the beaten path, so. All New Mexico. I talk it up and I let people know how spectacular it is. I think we show our pride the way that we've been talking about, by living your heritage. We also feel that deep sense of pride. All year, we are celebrating this great state we all call home. Taking a deeper look at our history to learn where we came from. Honoring the diverse cultures that come together right here. Profiling the people who made us who we are. Sharing unique experiences found nowhere else. And the spirit of New Mexicans, just like you. As we look toward the future and what more we can celebrate. We wish New Mexico a happy 110th birthday. Good night.